Psalm 19.1. Chris, you got that one. Psalm 19, or Psalm 33.6. Who wants that? Sylvia, you got that one. Psalm 19.1 for Chris and Psalm 33.6 for Sylvia. Mario, you got uh, Psalm 51.12. Psalm 51.12. How about Psalm 119.28? Who wants that one? Psalm 119.28. All right. Uh, Anaya, you got that one. <coughs> Psalm 119.28. I got four more. Luke 21.33. All right, Sylvia, you got that one. Luke 21.33. Proverbs 13.21. Brian, you got that one, Proverbs 13, 21. Two more, Psalm 42, 1. Anybody want that one? All right, and I, you got that one too, Psalm 42, 1. One more, Job 1, 1. Job 1, 1. Any volunteers for that one? All right, uh, Christian, you got that one. Job 1, 1. We're going to be in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14. We'll begin in just a moment. Uh, we'll be a place to the Bible here in just a second. Uh, before we get to that, let me just... Uh, ask you to be in prayer for uh, Doug's church with the, the VBS. It's a family VBS, second year to be doing that there. It's growing in popularity. Uh, more and more people, more and more families are being drawn to that, uh, which is exciting for Doug and for his purpose there and what he's doing there. Keep him in prayer, however he discovered. You know, uh, remember, remember where New, uh, First Baptist New Braunfels is? Do you remember the church across the street from it? Right across the street from the parking lot there? Hey. That's Episcopalian. And, uh, of course, on um, Thursday night, the, the last night of their VBS, they're doing a Pride Night. They're starting next Pride. Week. Yeah, yeah, they're doing a, a, a Pride Celebration Night. And, uh, and so they're sending out flags and all that. And, uh, and uh, just pray that, uh, uh, just ask for prayer, that, uh, that uh, God would be with them and that... Uh, How about a challenge? Yeah, they're... Uh, That's their last night that they're doing yeah, the VBS? Yeah, and... Uh, See if Doug wants to go there, let's all go and pray. Well, they, they so across the street. They you know, probably will like, have prayer for for them anyway, but they're not going to antagonize them. No, not antagonize And uh, but I, I do think, although there are a lot of folks there that would like to do that, uh, I don't think they're going to be dumb. encouraged to do that. Um, so um, it, it's going to be. Uh, uh, well, they're they're so put out with it now. It's it's to the point now where, but um, uh, I, I think that's the whole point of standing, though, isn't it? Is mm -hmm. that we but, don't. We don't aggressively move against people, but we don't back down either. Yeah, we stand, mm -hmm. we stand our ground. But pray for them for protection because, you know, especially Doug, because this is Doug's deal. Doug's the pastor of this, so he's the target. And uh, just pray that God would just protect him and his family and uh, protect the church there and stuff as they endeavor to do this. And, and uh, just, just keep them in prayer, okay? And uh, that, uh, that all would go well. And, because, uh, you know, I'm just telling you that, that it's becoming more and more militant. This whole life thing is becoming more and more militant. Oh, yes. And they like to say they take the high ground, but they don't. And, uh, so, they, and, uh, they like to just, say they're, they're inclusive, but they're not inclusive. No, they're not inclusive. And even the general populace, this just watched something last night where somebody, lady who's upset on the opposite side about the, uh, not Coles, the, Target, target yeah. moving their stuff to the back. Yeah. Is it? And I thought we weren't supposed to give in to terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> and she's calling us. And this is yeah. the general populace. She's calling yeah. us terrorists. Terrorists. Yeah. 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 So, well, that's okay. Call us whatever you want. I, I, I'm, I'm saying, saying, <laughs> saying it's, it's, like, it's coming. It's, it, it, it's always reversed. Everything's reversed. Uh, uh, also, just I, I was reading an article just before we get into this. I was reading an article that said uh, that said that. Uh, I just thought this was really interesting. Um, 
he's a writer for the uh, Washington Times, but he's a Christian, does a great job in these articles. And um, uh, he was talking about why Christians shouldn't go to homosexual weddings, mm -hmm. even as an attendance, mm -hmm. you know, in attendance, uh, and, and why they don't do that and why they shouldn't do it. And uh, e even if it's family members, and, and I, had a, I had a family member who was, mm -hmm. uh, turned gay and mm -hmm. got married, and I, I was invited and I wouldn't go, and, you know, and they couldn't understand why. I tried to explain it, but their family, their family, and my aunt and uncle couldn't understand it and, and stuff. And so, of course, I was the bad guy. But, you know, it, it's a good explanation. I, I really appreciate it, and I thought I would share it with you, try to get you to see this. One of the reasons we don't attend is because, basically, a homosexual marriage, what, all they've done is co-opted the Christian marriage, mm -hmm. right? Because they want to be able to do it in front of a pastor, you know, or a justice of the peace, but particularly a pastor. And, and the pastors echo pretty much what... The Christian marriage vows are, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so basically, what they're saying when they get married, what they're choosing to say is, you know, I don't believe in God or His Word, mm -hmm. and I'm vowing not to ever change my mind in regards to that. In other words, I'm vowing never to repent, right? Because. God's word requires repentance from sin, and homosexuality is sin. They know that. They won't admit it. They won't face up to it. They'll change it. They'll twist it. They'll do whatever they can. But basically, in their vow, that's what they're saying is, I refuse to never repent. And what they're saying to their partner is, and I'm committing to you that I'm going to do whatever I can to keep you from ever repenting as well. Does that make sense? It does. Because that's basically what they're saying to one another. I refuse to repent, and I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you from repenting so that we will never come to <clears throat> Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and so in, in which case we would have to abandon this role. We would have to abandon what we've been doing and turn away from it. Does that, does that make sense? So, so that's why Christians can't ever really attend is because basically <laughs> by our attendance, we're endorsing that. We're saying we support the fact that you're never going to repent. No, we think everybody has to repent and should repent of their sin, right? Mm -hmm. In order to have a right relationship with God, there has to be repentance. And if you're saying you're never going to repent, you're going to do everything in your power to keep from repenting, I can't support that. I can't encourage that. I can't, I can't be a part of that. Because by my attendance, I'm saying I agree with you. Mm -hmm. When you attend something like that, you're saying, I agree. That's that's why in, in a marriage, you know, like a, a, a Christian, I'll say, well, all of you who are here mm -hmm. do everything in your power to support these two in their marriage vows. And everybody says, I, I, we yeah. will, you know, and so like Why? Because they're a part of it, and we can't be a part of that, you know. And uh, so does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw that out there. I, I, I read that, and I go, that's a great way of putting it, is they refuse to repent, and be, I can't be a part of that because my whole Faith is built on the act of what? Repentance. Mm -hmm. Repent of my sin, turn to Jesus Christ, and uh, turn away from my sin. So, all right, well, let's, let's talk about the Word of God tonight, all right? So, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14, let's do our pledge to the Bible first. Hold your Bibles up, say, I believe, I believe that my Bible, that my Bible is, the Word of God. is the Word of God. I will love it. I will love it. I will learn it. I will learn it. And I will live it. And I will live it. Live it. To the glory of God. To the glory of God. Amen. That's our commitment to the Word of God tonight. We're in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 14, how God speaks to us. Let's take a look at the passage, Psalm 19, beginning in verse 1. Here's what the scripture says. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out unto all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law, now, he shifts now, talking about what? The law. The law, which is what? The word, right? Okay, so the word of God. So the law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. Refreshing the soul. The statutes, there's another word for the word, right? The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. 
The precepts, there's another word for the word of God. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord, it's another word, commandments are another word for the word of God. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord, believe it or not, the word fear is another word for the word of God. The fear of the Lord, the word of God, that you could put the word in there, it would be the same thing. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And then the decrees of the Lord. It's another word for the word. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold and much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. And then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, uh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And may God add his blessings on the teaching and, and uh, preaching of his word. All God's people said, Amen. 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 When, uh, Christians, um, when Christian minds, when, when Christians, we go outside, and whenever we turn to nature or look at nature, our hearts tend to turn to God. Would you agree with that? I mean, yeah. you can't help but go outside as a Christian and look at nature and go, man, God, you're awesome. God, this is amazing. Uh, you know, when I see the lightning storms, when I see the thunderstorms, when I see the rain, I think, God, how awesome you are. This is as scary as anything, but God, you're awesome. It's amazing, right? And uh, But Christian minds do that. We tend to turn to, um, to God when we see nature. However, the unconverted mind, <coughs> a lost person's mind, they simply... They, they don't see God in nature. They, they actually turn from God. As a matter of fact, uh, the unconverted tend to see nature as God. Mm -hmm. They tend to look at nature as God, and so that's why we give uh, nature the name what? Mother, Mother, nature. Mother nature. Isn't that interesting? There's Father God and Mother Nature, you know, which is the, the converse of God. So, so you know, Mother Nature or Gaia, as, as nature's been called, uh, or today, uh, Climate control, climate, uh, climate, or, or as as what's his face says, John Kerry says now it's no longer climate control, it's climate crisis. So that's where we're going to refer to it from now on. It's climate crisis because it's all a crisis. And as a matter of fact, uh, John Kerry said, if we don't act now in conjunction with climate crisis and to help this planet, if we don't do it now, we only have nine years left. That's his that's his word. That's now. what he said nine years ago. I know. We only have nine years left. That's what he said. So. Uh, isn't it interesting that all of this comes out at, at like this? And, and people buy into it. They just, yeah. they just accept it as true. But that's what the unconverted mind sees. They see nature as God. We see nature as evidence of God, yeah. as, as, as part of God's creation. Nature witnesses yeah. to God's invisible attributes, uh, like eternal power, divine nature. Creation witnesses to God's grace. It witnesses to God's faithfulness and caring for his creation. Creation reveals the infinite knowledge and wisdom of God. As we look at this, we go, God, what a, what a wise God to do what you've done, how, how things balance out like they do. Uh, God is so incredible in that. It reveals uh, the, the knowledge and wisdom of God. It reveals the holiness of God. It reveals God's glory, God's righteousness. I mean, God's creation is constantly, constantly speaking to us. And, uh, and I think that's something that the, the psalmist here is identifying with. He's, he's bringing that to our attention in this. Let's see, see what Hegel says here. He says, we're living in a world where without a, a word from God, nothing makes sense. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. without God, nothing makes sense. All of us have asked such questions as, who am I and why am I here? Do you know <laughs> that right now you're going more than 1,000 miles per hour? Right now, isn't that isn't that an interesting thought? We're traveling at a thousand miles per hour right now. That's how fast planet Earth is racing through space. We can't slow this Earth down, much less stop it. We can't change its direction. We are stuck on this planet. We're stuck here. Um, we can't change its direction. We can't alter it, much like the climate crises. Fanatics would like us to believe, right? They believe that we can change the planet. We can alter the planet. We can change it. We, can, um, we can't do that. And, uh, and so why? why? Why are we stuck on this planet? Is there a reason for us being here? Is there a reason God said you're limited to this planet? This is where you're going to have to live. 
Well, uh, the Bible tells us that we're here because we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There is a reason for us being here. This means in Christ we have new life and a purpose for being here, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. So what does Ephesians 2.10 tell us about our purpose in Christ? Listen to this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay. God created us to do what? Good, good works. works. That God prepared ahead of time for us to do. To do good works. That's what you write in. To accomplish the good works that God has prepared for us to do, we must know how God speaks to us then, right? I mean, it's important. If you're going to be able to accomplish what God left you here to do, you got to hear him speak to you about it. And there's no better place to discover this than in Psalm 19, because in this great psalm, we discover not only uh, David's, uh, the, the psalmist echoing about the power of God in nature and what nature test, how nature testifies and speaks to us about God, but he also jumps to the Word of God, talking to us about how we discover what we need to know God wants us to know about doing what God wants us to do to fulfill his work and his plan here, right? And so we go to the Word of God for that purpose. So he says that God speaks to us in at least three incredible ways. Now, there's more ways that God speaks to us. I'll mention those to you in a little bit, but, but there's three that are mentioned here. First, God speaks to us through the skies. That's chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 here. And God speaks to us in what theologians call special and general revelations. Uh, special revelation is when God speaks to us specifically through the Bible and tells us specifically how he wants us to live. So special or specific revelation. General revelation is when God reveals himself through nature. There's, it's more general revelation of his presence. So how does Psalm 19 beautifully describe God's general revelation? Listen to this. The, he the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. All right, there you go. The heavens declare <coughs> the glory of God. And the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So the skies are proclaiming his work. Now, to answer the basic question of life, we have two choices. We can either uh, speculation or rev revelation. We can believe in speculation or revelation. Speculation says everything that exists is here by cosmic accident. Revelation is communication from God telling us we're here by divine design. The heavens reveal or tell everyone that there is a God who created everything. It's just that most people choose not to believe that. They choose not to listen to nature. They choose not to listen to nature speak about the glory of God because they've identified nature in their heart and mind as God in some capacity. Um, but the heavens reveal or tell everyone if they'll just listen, right? I mean, that's the key. And there are, there are people who do listen. I mean, that's one of the things sometimes that brings people to Christ is the revelation of God via nature, right? But most of the time, I mean, when you think of other cultures who don't know God, they still get nature too, right? But it leads them to who? To a false god. It leads them to an, a, a, another god, a different god. So Satan's involved in that as much as the Spirit of God is involved in that as well. So, so it, it kind of works both ways. But the most, popular, um, uh, the most popular speculation about why we're all here, though, is what's called the Big Bang Theory. And you've heard about that, right? You know about that, the Big Bang Theory, all that. It basically says, a billions of years ago, there was a big explosion in space, and everything we see is the result <coughs> of that because of this Big Bang. But no one would believe an explosion in a print shop could produce an unabridged dic dictionary. <laughs> right? I mean, you've got to think about that. If it was in a, you know, just an explosion, all of a sudden you have a dictionary. You know, it came out of it. You know, after, after billions of years, this dictionary just now emerged. Nobody would believe that. Or would anybody believe an explosion in a junkyard could result in a perfectly made Boeing 747? No. Anything, anything, everything that's made is made because there is a design behind it. Behind it. And if there's a design behind it, then that must mean there's a what? There's a designer, right? If there's a design, then you've got to have somebody or something designing it. Uh, Hegel says, however, I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. I just believe God spoke and bang. <laughs> there it was. Um, to, the universe came into being just that quickly. How does Psalm 33, 6 describe how God created everything? Listen to this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Wow. The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and the stars by the breath of his mouth. Wow. So, he says, the Big Bang was the breath of God's mouth. The design, behavior, and harmony of the universe are God speaking to us. So the Big Bang was the breath of God's mouth. So God just breathed out, and there it was. Bang, there it was. It was all done, right? The universe was there. Um, but the heavens and skies, and through those, God speaks to us 
day after day. In fact, here's Psalm 19, 2 through 4 again. The, the, uh, through the heavens and the skies, God speaks to us day after day, and they pour, pour forth speech night after night and display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, the, the wor their words, to the ends of the world. So there, there is a deliverance of God's presence through nature, right? He's making himself known in that capacity. In other words, God's revelation of himself is not intermittent, but every single day, God is speaking to us through his magnificent creation. You might want to underline that, that last line there, every single day. It's not intermittent speech. It's every single day God is speaking to us through his magnificent creation. Do you remember the first time you saw the Grand Canyon? Mm -hmm. I, I truly, pictures do not do that justice, do they? You, I mean, you can look at the picture and you go, wow, it's pretty amazing and stuff like that, but only until you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and look at it can you, mm -hmm. I, I, it is just incredible. It's just amazing to see it. Yeah. I had the privilege of seeing Niagara Falls. Yeah. I um, was about nine and it's still in my mind. Yeah, so it, spectacular. It, it, those, some, of those, some of those natural occurrences, the things that God does and God did through the flood, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's, really, that's where all this came from. Was a flood. It is just incredible. Um, but God speaks to us every single day through his magnificent creation. So God speaks to us through the skies. Number two, God speaks to us through scripture. And this is really what I wanted to get us to tonight. Uh, God speaks to us in general ways through creation, which is general revelation. Uh, it, reve it reveals a God who creates. General revelation reveals a God who creates. However, creation doesn't reveal his specific will or purpose for our lives. God does that through Scripture, and this is called special revelation when we get it through God's Word. Special revelation reveals not only a God who creates, but also a God who cares about us. And so in verses 7 through 9, we find several titles or names for God's Word. Remember I pointed them out to you as we were reading the Scripture? Things like law, statutes or testimony, precepts or statutes, commands fear, ordinances, or judgments. And, and, and now from those same verses, list the six words that prescribe or describe the characteristics of God's Word. In other words, along with those words that uh, comes the characteristics of God's Word. Here they are. I'm going to give them to you real quickly. Number one was perfect. That's one of the words that went with it. The second word was trustworthy. The third word was right. Write that in there. So there's perfect and trustworthy and right. The fourth word was radiant. And the fifth word is pure and the sixth word is righteous. So those are the six verses, the six words, rather, that describe the characteristics of God's word. Uh, perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, pure, righteous. Would you agree with those? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's perfect characteristic traits of God's word. The benefits and blessings of God's word, Hegel says, are numerous and include reviving the soul, making wise the simple in verse 7, giving joy to the heart, giving light to the eyes, verse 8, and enduring forever, verse 9. There's not another book in the entire world like God's book, the Bible. Amen. There's not another book in the entire world that does what the Bible does. You know why? There's not another book that's God-breathed, right? Only the Bible is God-breathed, given by what we call inspiration, the breath of God. Amen? So it's God breathed. God spoke to those who wrote, wrote the Bible, and He had them write down what He wanted them to write. It's God breathed. It, when you open up the Bible and you read, um, the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you through that. If we just listen, Amen. If we just listen. Now, there's not another book that does what the Bible does. It does. Um, God speaks to us through His Word. Hegel says because the law of the Lord is perfect. The Hebrew word translated perfect is tamin, which means the Bible is not deficient in any ways. It's flawless. God's word cannot be improved upon because it's God's perfect, all-sufficient revelation. Amen. Now, one of the purposes of the Bible, the scripture says here in, in Psalm 119, one of the purposes of the Bible is reviving the soul. Now, the word translated reviving or converting is the word shuv, which means to restore or to return. In fact, how does King David use this word in Psalm 51.12? Listen to Psalm 51.12. Here we go. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Okay. And uphold. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, let's hear the whole and word. hold me into it thy Wow. So, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. What was the last part? And, 
And to uphold me with the Spirit. Okay, yeah, and uphold me with thy Holy Spirit, right? So with thy Spirit, uphold me with thy Spirit. So restore to me the joy of your salvation. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple, Psalm 19.7. That's the one that Psalm 19.7. Uh, God's word makes us wise concerning salvation. By the way, Psalm 119 is all about the word of God, too, so that's why we do that. But God's word makes us wise concerning salvation, according to 2 Timothy 3.15, and successful living. God's word also affects us emotionally because the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. God's word has the power to cheer us up when we're down. God's word encourages us when we're discouraged. But what else does Psalm 119.28 tell us God's word can do? Listen to this. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. All right, so it can strengthen me. That's what the word of God does. It can strengthen me. And it gives me wisdom. That's one of the reasons I'm spending so much time on Ephesians chapter 6. Because I'm telling you, there's coming a, there's coming a moment when we're just going to have to take our stand. And we're going to have to stand up for God. We're going to have to stand. We're going to have to do what the... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. We're going to have to take our stand, but we're also going to have to stand with the full armor of God if we're going to be able to, to hold the line, if we're going to be able to stand and, and hold the line for God's sake. Um, that's, that's why it's so important that we understand the Word of God and what He's saying about the armor, because that's what gives us the strength then to be able to stand and to take our stand. It, it comes from God's Word. Amen? And, and that, that's one of the reasons I'm spending so much time doing this. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Psalm, uh, enduring forever. Psalm 19:9. The word fear is an unusual synonym for God's word, but it's referred to as fear because it's the source of reverence and respect for God. Uh, enduring forever refers to its eternal principles. And, and by the way, that's one of the reasons that you know we we show respect for God's word. Um, that's one of the reasons we don't want to. Um, misuse or abuse God's word. You know, we treat it with respect. You know, a well-used Bible is a wonderful thing. You know, when the pages are crimped, when, when it's well-used and stained and because you you know, read it, and maybe tears have fallen on it, maybe, I mean, whatever, that's wonderful. That's, that's, that's not disrespect. That's showing respect for God's word. Amen? A well-used Bible is showing respect. Disrespect, I think, is when a Bible is taken and put on a shelf and ignored. Amen. I think that's disrespect. And uh, and um, don't be surprised if now in the future, going forward, we don't see more and more disrespect being shown to the Word of God. And we've already seen a lot of it. A lot of disrespect is being shown to the, to the Christian flag, to the American flag. Uh, but the Bible, I mean, the Bible has been disrespected in, in large ways. It's been burned and banned and all kinds of things down through the centuries. But in the culture we're living in right now, don't, don't be surprised if you see the Bible being disrespected, as you see pages being torn out, as you see the Bible being mocked. Um, at this, uh, at this uh, L.A., what, the Dodgers, is it the Dodgers? Um, at their, at, they're inviting these uh, trans Sisters of perpetual, perpetual stupidity or something like that. Uh, yeah, perpetual, whatever. They're, they're transgender uh, Folks who dress as nuns and mock Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross, and and uh, they, they've invited them to do it during the game and uh, and to put that on display during the game. It is it is a mockery of Christianity. It's a mockery of Christ, and and they're mocking the Word of God. They're making fun of the Word of God like that. But we show respect for the Word of God, and because it's God breathed, it, it, it's the presence of God through His Word to us. Amen? Amen. It, it, it's, when we open the pages and we read it, it's God himself speaking to us. And God is directing our paths and God is showing us what we need to know and how we need to live and what we need to say and how we need to respond. And you know, These are the things that, that God's word will do for us. And, 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 and so we've got to show the respect that's due it. And, um, and yet we've got to know how to do that in such a way that we honor the word of God. In other words, if somebody's tearing up the Bible and messing it up, I don't think attacking them is showing respect to the Word of God. Does that make sense? Why? Because the Bible says, remember what Jesus said when somebody slaps you, where? In the face. What do you do? Turn your cheek. In other words, you don't, you don't throw enough punch back. right? You, 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 they slap you, you don't punch back. So I, I guess what I'm saying is that 
were somebody to tear up the Bible in front of me and throw it down in the market, I, I would not retaliate at that moment. But I'll tell you what I would do, I'd wait till things quieted down a little bit, and then I'd go pick up the pages of the Bible, and I'd treat them with respect, and I'd gather it all up, and I would discard it, I would discard it appropriately, but I would not let it be like that, okay? Um, I, I think that's, <coughs> I think that we, we have to know, we have to think these things through in relationship to the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. And, in, and to some degree, I think in these last days now, I think to some degree we have to put ourselves mentally into scenarios that may or may not occur. So we can be ready. So we can be ready. So we have to think about how would I respond in that situation. Where you work at, where some of you young people are working at, you need to put yourself in scenarios that may happen there. How are you going to respond? You need to prepare yourself mentally with the Word of God in connection to that. How are you going to deal with that? Um, how are you going to respond? Um, because I, I'm telling you, that's what it's going to take to stand up against the vileness of our culture. We, we have to learn to do that. We're going to have to figure out how to do that if we're going to hold the line for the cause of Christ. Does that, does that make sense? And, and uh, So anyway, okay, well, let's read on here. He says, the fear of the Lord is pure and it's enduring forever. Enduring forever means it's eternal principles. In fact, how does Jesus describe the enduring qualities of God's word in Luke 21, 33? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Okay. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. My words will never pass away. My words will never pass away. Now, the ordinances uh, of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. The word translated ordinances or judgments is mishpat, which refers to a verdict or the decisions of a judge, the judgments and rebukes and punishments of God recorded in the Bible are righteous, which means they're right in a moral sense. God doesn't do anything that's not just and right. Amen? Amen. And, and whatever judgments God is bringing is just and righteous and needed. Amen. God wouldn't bring it if it wasn't needed, right? Right. And, uh, and if there isn't repentance in our country, if there isn't a turning away from our sin in our country, then the judgment that God is bringing is needed. It's Amen. needed. And it's needed probably more than anything for Christians. Because Christians have to be awakened. Amen. But I, I'm thrilled to see. I think I think that's starting to happen. I, I do. And I think there are more and more Christians beginning to stand up. I think they're beginning to do that. May I suggest to you that um, we need to stand up. And I, I mentioned this Sunday, but I'll say it again. We need to stand up. And, and one of the ways we stand up is by not buying from Target. Mm -hmm. Because when we go into a Target store, be, and it's not because the, the, these stores are being forced to do it, or, and, and so this is different. Target's a little bit different here. Target is doing this in your face because they want to. They, they, they chose a designer that's, uh, that's a Satanist on purpose. The one who designs all their clothing that they're for pride is a Satanist. He's open about Satanist. They've done that on purpose. Target is doing this because they're, they're just pushing it. They want to push it. We cannot, just like the homosexual marriage that I explained to you about, why we can't participate in homosexual marriages, regardless of whether it's family members or not. We should never, as Christians, we should never do that. But the same principle applies in these stores. We shouldn't shop there. And uh, and and look, there's some things at Target that I like to buy. There's some things there I wouldn't mind buying, and occasionally I'd go in for and stuff like that. But not now. I'm not going to do it. When they're pushing this stuff, I'm not going to do it. Uh, then I'm just not going to do it. I have to stand on my principles in regards to that. Because if I go in there and buy stuff right now, especially with them doing this, I'm endorsing them and I'm saying I'm, I'm believing. So I'm not going to give them money to endorse what they're doing. Does, does that make sense? Same with the ESPN. The ESPN is not just raising the pride flag over their, over their campus. They're raising the transgender flag over their campus now. And, uh, and they're doing that as a in-your-face type of thing. Um, so, I, you know, I think there comes a moment when more and more Christians have to stand up and say, I'm just not going to buy into this anymore. I'm just not going to participate with this anymore. That's why I don't go to Disney. That's why I won't go to Disney. I, I won't go into a Disney store. And I won't, I won't go to Disneyland or Disney World or anything like that. And you know how much of a Disney fanatic I was. I loved Disney. I used to love Disney, but not now. Not now. I, it's I not am, the same now. No, it's not. And... They're, they're, they're pushing their agenda. You, they're, 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 they're critters. The, 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 you never know where Mickey Mouse is a man or a woman or, or Minnie Mouse is a... I'm not even that. I, we never knew that anyway. 
But, I, you know, right now what they're doing is they're taking the princesses and having men dress up as princesses and having the men be the princesses, whether it's Belle or, or Cinderella or any of them like that. They're having men dress up as women and, and, and then loving children and holding children. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Uh, and if we can't see that, I, you know, as Christians, I, I think we need to get back to a better and deeper study of the Word of God. Amen? I mean, so, so I, just, I, I just think there are things that we can do to take our stand. And at some point, we have to do that. At some point, how far are we going to allow this culture to, in, in, to, to, to in, um, inject the evil and immorality into us? before we finally stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate in that. As Christians, I think we have God's word on that, that we need to do that. that that's the whole point of wearing the what? The armor. I mean, that's the whole point when you get right down to it. Armor is for battle. Armor is for battle. And, and these are defensive weapons that God has given us to use. And so though we, we don't have to go against them pushing, like in that sense, we just stand. And we find ways to do that. Okay, well, anyway, uh, they're all right. Uh, God's Word can do wonderful things, Hegel says. David writes, they are more precious than gold, more, uh, uh, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Gold was the most valuable commodity in David's culture, and honey the sweetest substance. I think honey is still a really sweet okay. substance. I think, I, I, actually, you know, once I got off of sugar, um, honey just was a, now I'm having to cut back on honey because, <laughs> you know, I eat too much honey. I mean, but honey is just as sweet as anything. I mean, it really is. And, and, uh, but when we let God speak to us through his word, it is valuable and it's enjoyable. And everybody said, Amen. 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 It is. It's instructive. It's valuable. It's enjoyable. Also, we are warned by God's word in Psalm 1911. The word translated warned means enlightened to the dangers of sin. But in keeping them, he says in verse 11, there is great reward. So what does Proverbs 13, 21 tell us about this? Listen to this issue. Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is the reward of the righteous. Wow. Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is the reward of the righteous. Oh. So misfortune pursues the sinner. Prosperity is the reward of the righteous. Mm, what kind of prosperity? Nothing else heaven's prosperity. What? There's nothing else heaven's prosperity. Okay, heaven's prosperity, the blessings of God. Peace, peace, peace here on earth. Yeah, peace. peace. Yeah. yeah, peace. Yeah. And the way he allows us to see how he takes care of us. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Financial? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think all the time. Financial prosperity all the time. I mean, God has promised us He's going to take care of us, right? He's going to feed us, going to clothe, right? I mean, He's going to do all that. Mm -hmm. I, look at what He says. He says, if we obey God's word about love, we're going to prosper in our what? Relationships. relationships. So if we obey God in regards to love, our relationships are going to prosper. If we obey the principles in the Bible about hard work, about saving, and about investing, we're going to prosper how? Financially. But our greatest reward will be to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now that's going to be a glorious day. Amen? Amen. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God's word is amazing. It's amazing. So the question then is, how do we study it? How do we study God's word? All right. Take your pen, pencil, and just write. In the, I'm going to give you just some Bible study tips. I'm just going to give them to you once again. Um, just to refresh your memory. You know all of them anyway, but I'm just going to refresh your memory with them a little bit. Here's how to study Bible. There's many ways to study the Bible, and if you're currently doing it on your own, you probably already worked out a system of Bible study if you're doing it daily and doing your own Bible study, because we develop our own patterns and things like that, and that's wonderful. You should do that. The Holy Spirit's going to you. But there's a few basic things to do. First of all, if you're not doing Bible study right now, here's the first thing you do. Choose a book of the Bible to study. Just make a choice. Just make a choice. Any book you're interested in will do. Start... You know whether it's a, whether it's a, you know James or First John or or one of the Gospels or Philippians or something like that. Just pick a book and start studying it. Then start your 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 your, your study time with prayer. Always start with prayer. Okay. 
Ask God to open your heart. Remember, I pray this every every message. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, and our and our and our and our, our ears, and all, all that we are to the deeper truths of your word. Right? I ask the Holy Spirit to do that because we want God's Spirit to help us to see what God's trying to say to us. Right? So we ask the Holy Spirit of God to lead us. In second term, Timothy three sixteen says, "All Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness." Um, Psalm 119, 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives life and gives understanding to the simple. I like that one. Uh, Psalm 119, 130, The unfolding of your words gives life. Lord, you said that in your word that it gives life. God, help me to see. Right? Help me to see what your word is saying to me today. And you can pray that as you start to study your word. Number three, read the entire book. Just read the entire book. Now, this may take, depending on the size of the book that you choose to start with, it may take a couple of days. But you got you need to do it a couple of times, do, and and I mean, do it one day and then wait a day and do it the next. So read the whole book. Uh, again, if it's a long book, if it's if it's forty chapters or thirty chapters or you know one hundred and twenty nine chapters, whatever, something you know, whatever you know, if you choose to read the Book of Psalms, okay, <laughs> it's going to take you several days, right? But then go back and do it again. Now I wouldn't recommend reading. The whole book of Psalms. I, I, I mean, take it a psalm at a time. And then, but I mean, you know, depending on how many chapters. Like, if you're going to read Genesis, you're going to. It's a lot of chapters, so you're going to have to go. You know, do take a couple of days and read it, and then go back and do, take a couple more days and read it again. But read it twice, and each time you read it, when you read it like that, uh, look for themes that may be woven into the chapter. Sometimes you'll detect general messages and portions of the passages that you're reading. Um, or ideas, and, and write them down then. Just have a pen or paper with you, and write down those things that, that jump out at you as you're, as you're, as you're reading through it. So that's God, God's Word to begin to speak to you more personally as you're reading it. Number four, zoom in then. Once you've done that a couple of days, read, read it a couple of times through like that, then zoom in. Now you can get to slow down and read the book verse by verse, breaking down the text, looking for deeper understanding. You know, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active. It really wants to minister to you. So start to look at the verses under a microscope. Don't be afraid to ask questions like who, what, when, why, where, how, all of those, okay, as you're reading it. And say, who said this? Why did they say this? What's this about? Right? And um, what's he trying to say to me? Where, where's, where's this leading? Where did it come from? Where did he come from? You know, ask those kind of questions. Number five, choose the tools you wish to. To use, choose the tools you wish to use. Whether it's a Bible dictionary, whether it's a, a notepad, colored highlighters, colored pen. I mean, a lot of people do, use color highlighters to highlight different. You know, if they're talking about to me, then I'll use it this color. If they're talking about God, I'll use this color. If they're talking about others, I'll use this color. You know, and, and that way it just it just makes it stand out. You're looking for specific things then when you use various colors like that. I write all my sermons in three colors. Uh, I use black. I use red and I use blue. Uh, the red always is scripture. If I'm if I'm writing anything, if I'm writing scripture down, uh, then it's always in red. You know, and various thoughts require various colors. So uh, uh, various thoughts. If I'm from like a major point, if I'm using a major point, I'll use black, and then followed up by sub points, I'll use blue and things like that. So so it, it distinguishes thoughts for me. Even as I'm writing it, it helps me to do that. But at the same time, it helps me in the preaching of it, too, because then I'm, I'm able to follow my thought pattern like that. Does, does that make sense? So uh, use various colors uh, like that, or, or use uh, some commentary. If, if you have a study Bible, uh, the commentary in the study Bible is a great resource. I love that because it, it, it promotes thought on your part. Uh, read the commentary that goes with the passage you're studying. It'll just help make you think about it a little bit. Uh, help stimulate your thoughts. Number six, then, not only choose the tools you wish to use, but number six, be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the word. Just make the commitment that I'm going to do, if there's something God is really putting on our heart to do, I'm going to do it. Uh, Luke 11, 28 says, but even more blessed are all who... Uh, are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. Luke eleven twenty eight. So be a doer of the word. Just make a commitment to do that. Number seven, set your own pace. Set your own pace. Uh, choose the best time and place to do your Bible study that best fits your schedule. You know, uh, sometimes I'll read the word of God before I go to sleep. Before I go to bed, I'll, I'll 
I'll get my phone out sometimes because I'm just I just want to do it. And I just want to relax a little bit. So and I just want to calm down. I just want my spirit to calm, and I'll and I'll just open up a Bible app and I'll just read some scripture before I go to bed. You know, sitting there like that. Now I'm not studying when I do that. I'm just reading. You know why? Because I'm getting ready to do what? Go to sleep, right? So probably not the best time to do Bible study, right? Because if you're getting ready to go to sleep, you don't want to stimulate your thoughts more. You don't want to, you know, you want to, you want to calm down a little bit. But then on the other hand, if you try to do Bible study, you're going to be doing some of the, right? And so you're not really going to be studying anyway. Um, do you remember uh, Sedona when you were in college? Did you ever stay up late at night studying for the next day? Did you ever do that? Yeah. 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 I, I did too. And it was. Um, there were nights I was up till two and three in the morning. I, I, I was able to get like two or three hours sleep and had to be ready for the next day and I had to be ready to deal with the test or whatever assignment was due and stuff like that. I'd be doing that. And how did you stay awake? Um, usually I would just put on some kind of noise in the background, like just plug in my headphones and yeah. just have that constant noise. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to stay. Everything inside of you wants to sleep. It's hard to stay awake. And uh, that's why I would do it in public. I would go to a Sambo's restaurant, and I would sit because Sambo's was open 24 hours. Coffee cost a dime back then when I was in college. It was 10 cents for a cup of coffee. I would sit there and drink <laughs> multiple pots of coffee <laughs> for a dime. Uh, they didn't like me, uh, but uh, that's why they put. That's why. That's why coffee prices were raised. But anyway, uh, I, I alone did that. Uh, but yeah, stimulants, whatever it takes to stay awake like that. We don't want to do that with God's word. We don't need to do that with God's word, right? Find a better time, because there's not, there's not something that's due the next day unless you're a pastor and you don't have anything to preach until the next day. Then you're in panic mode and then you're up all night. I did that when I first started preaching. All right, so before I learn. You learned. Before I learn. All right, so let's set your own pace. Choose a good time to do it when you're awake and alert and, and can enjoy what God wants to say to you like that. Uh, and it becomes more personal that way. Those are the steps, okay? Those are the major steps. Let me just give you real quick to now the way God speaks to us. Now God will speak to us in a lot of different ways. Now of course it's through the word. We already said that, but let me give you seven others. Alright? Well first of all it's through his word. Second Timothy three sixteen, we know that. Number two, it's through our inner voice. Just write that in there. Through our inner voice. That's Acts eight twenty nine talks about that, how God speaks to, to us through our inner voice. You'll hear that inner voice. And sometimes it's almost audible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just almost like God says, don't. There, I tell you, there are times and have been times in my life when it's almost been like I've heard God say to me out loud, don't go there. Don't go. And uh, many times it's been in relationship to places that I was about to enter. And for one reason or another, God said, don't go. And I had to listen to that inner voice. Now, maybe I could have went in there and nothing bad would have happened, everything fine, but there's a reason that that inner voice says don't do it, and you should listen to it. So God will speak to us that way. Uh, God will speak to us through other people, thirdly, through other people. That's Acts 8, 34 through 36, through other people. Through other people. And God has done that to me and through me. Amen? Number four, God speaks to us through circumstances. Through circumstances. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through 9. God speaks through circumstances, situations. God will speak to us. God will allow us to see certain things and to experience certain things because he wants us to wake up sometimes. He'll speak to us about, hey, wake up. It's time to, to do something here. Number five, he'll speak through supernatural events. God will speak through supernatural events. Numbers 22, 28 through 31. Numbers 22, 28 through 31. Supernatural events. He'll speak to us that way. And then number six, God will speak through inner peace. God will speak to us through inner peace. Do you have a peace about it? Is there a sense of peace about what it is you're having to deal with? That's 2 Corinthians 2.12. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through inner peace. 
But there's one more way that it'll speak to us, and this is the third um, point in Hegel's study. You could call it number seven if you want, but it's, it's the third way, and God speaks to us through our souls, which again would be inner peace, but it's, it's through our souls, all right? Um, Hegel says this in, in dealing with chapter 19, Psalm 19, verses 13 through 14. He says, we are born with a yearning in our souls to know God. It is God's way of drawing us to himself. He draws us through our soul. How does Psalm 42, 1 describe this yearning? Listen to this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Is that just for Christians? No. No, it isn't. Everybody wants a God because everybody needs God. They just don't know the God that they need yet. The tragedy is Satan intervenes and provides substitute gods <coughs> to the real God. Does that make sense? <coughs> so there's this need for a God and so many people, and depending on the culture, will turn to that which the culture provides or is most predominant or preeminent in that culture, whether it's Buddha, or, or whether it's uh, Muhammad, or, or whoever this deity, this godlike deity may be. Uh, in our culture, are there substitute gods to the one true God? All over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all kinds, right? We've already mentioned a couple. One is climate crisis. <laughs> the climate issue, that's, that has become a, a, a religion or a god to a lot of people. Um, anything else? Satan, obviously. Satanism is strong in our culture, so Satan becomes their god, right? What? Science itself. Science has become a god to a lot of people. They worship at the altar of science, which really is humanism, which is self deity, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we set ourselves up as god, and so we, we're actually worshiping ourselves, uh, worshiping humanity in that sense like that. And so the soul naturally needs a God or needs God, but we'll settle for whatever God is available at that moment until we hear about the one true God. That's why we are evangelical Christians. Amen? Our responsibility, our job is to try to help as many people as we can understand that the one true God is only found through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh. Amen. Right? Does that make sense? So that, that's our objective. Well, Hegel says, like a wild deer struggling to find water during a drought, our souls thirst for God. This is because God created our souls with a deep spiritual thirst only he can truly quench. Therefore, the psalmist writes, my soul thirsts for God, for the, what kind of God? Living, Living God, not a dead God. By the way, if you worship yourself, if you worship humanity, is that a living or a dead God? Dead. Dead God, because what's going to happen to all of humanity? Expire. Yeah, they're going to expire. All of humanity dies, including all of us. The difference is our soul is going to be given a new what? Body. We're going to be given a new body, a glorified body. And, uh, and that's going to be the, well, so are the dead in Christ who don't know Christ who die physically. They're going to be given a glorified body, too. It's going to be a separation from God. Right, but they're going to be where? In hell, right? So that's how they can be tormented forever in hell, is because they have a glorified body that's going to be able to experience that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, when you think about it, that, that, that you know, to worship the living God anything that we worship outside of Jesus Christ is a dead God. It's not a living God. Amen? There's only Amen. one living God. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. So, so therefore the psalmist writes, my soul first for the living God. When God speaks to us through the skies, through scripture, or our souls, the desire of our hearts will be to pray then, keep your servant also from willful or presumptuous sins. This is so we'll live lives that are blameless or upright, and be innocent of the great transgression which is departing from God's way, according to verse 13. 
So when God speaks to us, we will also want the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts to be pleasing in his sight. That's verse 14. The personal virtues in verse 13 and 14 are plainly seen, for example, in the life of Job. How is he described in Job 1.1? Listen to this. This is Job. Right off the bat, Job is described this way. Listen to this. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and shunned evil. Wow, he was blameless and upright. That's what the word perfect means. He was blameless and upright, revering God and shunning evil. He was blameless and upright, revering God and shunning evil. And that, oh, what, a, what a wonderful testimony about a man of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. Or a woman of God. What a great testimony that is. So, Hegel says this. Remember, God speaks to you through the skies, through Scripture, and through your soul. We just got to make sure we're what? Listening. Right? Mm -hmm. He wants to speak. We just got to tune in and listen. You'll hear him. Yeah. You'll hear him just like you've heard him tonight. God has spoken to each of us tonight already, hasn't he? Amen. We just have to choose to listen. And all God's people said, Amen.